Welcome to Before You Leave Home. My name is Mike Minter, and I'm the teaching pastor at Reston Bible Church, where I've been for the last 43 years. The only reason I mention my longevity is because that gives me some credibility to let you know that I have seen the trajectory of hundreds of lives through the years. And I want yours to be a good trajectory as you enter college and particularly after you leave. I have married couples, seen their children grow up and married them, and now they're having kids. So I've seen generations go through this, and it's been my privilege through the years to observe, to watch, to see, to study the trajectory of lives. Some go well, some don't go so well. So in the time that we have, I want to uh, walk you through what I think you're going to experience. As a matter of fact, what I know you're going to experience in college, all right? You are probably 17, 18, 19 years old, <clears throat> getting ready to head off into college. The secular university is going to have teachers that are not allowed to bring in their particular religious views. Not all of your professors are out to get you, but some are. It's a secular university, if that's in fact where you're going. They're probably 45, 50, 55 years old, maybe older. And for you to stand up against their logic and their reasoning, particularly if it's a philosophy class, a religion class, a biology class, where they're going to try to prove that there either is no God or how you came to be, you have no possibility of standing up against them. They've been around this block a number of times. They're a lot smarter than you are. They know a lot more than you do about all these different disciplines of life, and they're going to clobber you in any kind of an argument. And that's the objective that's going to take place. And this is why about 75% of young people wind up losing their faith. They claim to be believers as they enter college. Secular, the term secular simply means that it's a God-free zone. In other words, there can be no invoking the presence of some deity or some supernatural source. So everything in a secular university is going to be based upon human reasoning, human logic, human knowledge, along with some good science and some really bad science. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So if you're not wise when you enter in, if you don't have a strategy, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to survive because you're entering into the lion's den. And when Daniel went into the lion's den, he entered in with God on his side, and he came out well. All right, so that's the importance of understanding what I'm trying to tell you, because I care for your soul. I just want life to turn out well for you, for your sake. I've been to college. I've been around the block a number of times. I know what you're up against, all right? So as we dive into this, several things. I want to talk a little bit about the strategy of the enemy. I trust that if you're a believer, you're aware of the fact that Jesus talks about what he calls the world system. The world system is an organized system with all of human knowledge, human reasoning, human wisdom, human ways in order to accomplish what humans want to accomplish. The Bible refers to this world system as the kingdom of darkness. And he talks, Jesus talks about the head of that world system is Satan. He also says in John chapter 8, he says that Satan is a liar and the father of lies, that there is no truth in him. Thus, the world system is not going to speak truth. That doesn't mean it won't speak truth on 2 plus 2 equals 4. I'm talking about it not speaking truth in the moral, soulish arena of life. And the enemy wants to capture your soul. And you're going to be lied to a lot in college, in university, I can tell you right now. And unless you're wise and entering in, you will not recognize when you're being lied to. So here's the strategy of the enemy. The strategy of the enemy is this. All the way back to the garden, when Satan says to Eve, Yea, hath God said. Did God really say? He wants to crack her intellect. He wants to get into her mind and create a doubt. That's exactly how the enemy works. You go off to college. You're 18 years old. You go, go to a class, and all of a sudden... The, the philosopher, the biology teacher tells you, I can prove there is no God. And by the way, they're allowed to do that. They might also say, I can prove there's no absolute truth, that there's no absolute morality. And you start listening and you realize they have a lot more knowledge. Notice what I said, knowledge, not wisdom, knowledge than you do. They crack the intellect. Once they've got your intellect, the next thing to fall 
is they'll get your morals. Because your intellect, once it's been opened up to perhaps other views than the scriptural view, you're going to want you're going to want to have some real fun at college. You're going to want to engage in the sexual activities and the drunkenness and all the different stuff that goes on because your flesh desires that. So you're kind of hoping they can crack a little bit more of your intellect. Once he's got your intellect or once she's got your intellect or once the college has got your intellect, it's going to get your morals. Once it has gotten your morals, it's going to get your faith. And it's not going to be the faith you grew up with, all right? It's going to be no faith or a very questioned faith. Once it's got your intellect and then your morals, once they've got your morals, they've got your faith. Once they've got your faith, they've got your life. And they've got the trajectory of your life. I have seen young people that were fairly strong in their faith go off to college, and I've seen them buy into the whole philosophical worldview and literally enter college as pure as the new driven snow and come out looking like they went through a cesspool. And I don't want that to happen to you. One of the things that you'll experience, and I experienced this when I went to college, I was stunned at some of the immorality, some of the things that I saw. Through the years and my years of teaching the Bible, I've come to realize that it goes from shock to being able to tolerate it, from being able to tolerate to accept it, from being able to accept it to embrace it, from embracing it to promoting it. I've seen young people come out of this church from good homes that are now promoting immorality, promoting it, from shock all the way to promotion. That's how it goes. That's how the enemy works. That's exactly how he works. And so I'm giving you this little bit of a lecture here to let you know that there's a strategy. You need to enter in with some kind of awareness of what you're entering into because if you're not aware you're going to get taken by surprise and you'll get taken out of the fight. So how do we resist this? One of the first things that I want you to be aware of is this. College can be a lot of fun, good fun, good, clean fun. You're going to meet some people I hope that you stick with all of your life. As a good friend of mine once said, find a few good friends and grow old together. When you go in, first go in with the understanding that you need a strategy. You're going in defensively. Get yourself involved in Campus Crusade. Get yourself involved in Navigators, InterVarsity, some of the really good programs. Have some accountability when you enter. Iron sharpens iron. All of your friends, all of your Christian friends are going to be experiencing the same battles, the same temptations as you are, and you're going to need some people to hold you up in that fight. The second thing that I want to take a little time on here regarding the strategy, don't buy in to the fact that just because a person wears a lab coat or has a PhD in science means that everything they say is truly science. This is really key. You might hear scientific studies say that coffee is bad for you. Five days later, scientific studies say coffee is good for you. Scientific studies say that protein is good for you. Scientific studies say protein is bad for you. How can that be scientific? Science deals with absolute truth. That's what science is. Science, when, when something is scientific, scientists always put it through these tests. Is it observable? Is it reproducible? Is it measurable? Throw a ball up in the air a thousand times, it comes down a thousand times. It's observable. It's reproducible. It's measurable at speed, the acceleration. That's true science. So when you go into a biology classroom and they say, I can prove that we evolved. Can you observe it? Is it reproducible? Is it measurable? No. Therefore, it doesn't fall into the category of science. Neither does creation. You can't observe creation, you can't reproduce it, and you can't measure it. Both come from looking at data differently, from a worldview, all right? I just want you to be aware that those three words are key. Is it observable, reproducible, measurable? So when you hear something that this is absolute truth, run it by those three words. If it doesn't follow that, it's not science. And that is key. Or you'll get sucked in by listening to these people tell you these things. And just because they've got three PhDs behind them doesn't mean it's truth. Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But which one actually tells the truth? The Bible or 
the kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. Let's take a look at some things. When you go into a secular society, which we live in, there's a never ending increase in knowledge. Knowledge is designed to solve problems. We have an increase in knowledge in every single area of life. We know more today than we did yesterday about every single subject. So let's sort of plot this out. Knowledge is increasing literally at an exponential rate. We know more about marriage than we've ever known. And marriages are in more trouble than they've ever been. We know more about diet than we've ever known. We're heavier than we've ever been. We know more about neuroscience and brain chemistry than we've ever known. There's more depression than there's ever been. We know more about bulimia and anorexia than we've ever known, and it's on an exponential increase. We know more about finances than we've ever known, and nations and this nation are more indebted, more personal bankruptcies and indebtedness than we've ever been. Every single area, doesn't make any difference what it is, we've studied it, we've learned about it, but the problems increase. That makes no sense at all. But yes, it does. Because the scriptures say that God has no problem with knowledge increasing. He says, just don't leave me out of it. Because I'm the source of all knowledge and all wisdom. And if you have knowledge, which is nothing more than an increase or a gathering of information, wisdom is the proper application of that knowledge. So you can have a lot of knowledge, but you don't have any wisdom. That's why all those areas that I just listed are on the increase. This is the world producing these statistics saying, what's wrong? Why can't we seem to solve our problems? And the Bible is quite clear. It's a heart condition. It's a sin condition. And that's why the world is in the condition that it's in. And that's why we seem to be on this never ending treadmill. 5,000 years of recorded human history and nothing has changed. Everything remains the same. Sure, we're living a little bit longer. We have better air conditioning and all that, but that has not changed the mental problems, the heart problems, the difficulties we experience every single day of life. And so when I look at this, I want to read something to you out of Scripture. This is out of the book of 2 Timothy. Now just listen and see if this is not observable, reproducible, and measurable. All right, this is the Scripture speaking now. Paul says this, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. I got to tell you, I got to just be real honest up front. That's about the dumbest logic I've ever heard in my entire life. How could the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago, a very bright man, predict that in the last days, which are the days from the cross all the way up to now, that things wouldn't get better? Wasn't Paul aware that there was an increase in knowledge? Certainly knew there was an increase in knowledge of his own time. How could he possibly predict that things would get worse? Because he knew that mankind would not apply wisdom. And every single day, it's observable, it's reproducible, and it's measurable. Because God is all wise. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So when I think about all of these things, a few last thoughts. One of the tricks of the enemy is going to be this. <clears throat> and I want you to listen real carefully to this. One of the truths of the enemy is going to be, you're going to enter college, and hopefully you'll take my advice, take God's advice, I should say. And all of a sudden, you're going to notice a lot of your friends, secular friends, or maybe even some of your Christian friends are starting to fall in to sin. They're enjoying it, sleeping around, doing a lot of drinking, partying, having a great time. And you're thinking, wait a minute. I thought if you sinned, there would be some consequences, and you're not seeing any consequences. Here again, the wisdom of Scripture. The law of the harvest says you reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, but you reap after you sow. When you throw corn into the ground, it doesn't come up the next day. Sexual sin, drug abuse, all that kind of stuff does not come up the next day. As a matter of fact, the reason people enjoy sin is because it's enjoyable. The Bible says so. It says of Moses that he refused 
the pleasures of sin for a season. He literally chose affliction over the pleasures of sin for a season. It isn't until later, when you get through college and you think you've had a great time and all, you, all, the, all the sleeping around, all the immorality and everything else, and all of a sudden it begins to catch up with you in your marriage, in your children, everything else. The trajectory always goes in that direction. So, I just want to leave you with these thoughts. Number one, if you happen to be watching this and you're not a believer, you're not a believer, I would just encourage you to listen to these, these words. The scriptures are true. They just simply are. I could go into that in many different directions. They're true. You're going to get lied to daily. If you don't know Jesus, you don't have chances at all of really getting through life in any kind of a victorious way. You must know him. And the way to know him is to recognize the fact that you have sinned and fallen short of, a, of the glory of Almighty God. And you're in desperate need of salvation. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And if you've never put your faith in Christ by realizing that your religion won't save you, your human goodness won't save you, you must come to Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. Believing in Him that He died, was buried, and rose again the third day, paid the penalty for your sin. When you realize that He paid the penalty for your sin, and He also takes His righteousness and places it to your account the moment that you believe, that's what it means to be a Christian. So I leave all of you with this. Wisdom does not guarantee that you will have no problems. It simply guarantees you won't be the cause. I wish you well, and I trust that you'll listen to this maybe a few times. Let it sink deep into your soul. Stay in the Word. Find a few good friends. Grow old together. Blessings, and thanks for watching this video.